Please turn them in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3a. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians was written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians living in the city of Thessalonica. This early epistle is written to encourage these believers in their faith and to also help them understand more about the eternal things of God. Up to this point, Paul's commended these believers for their faith, hope, love, service, and heart for the lost. And he's also defended himself, his ministry, and his motives. And and then, as we saw in chapter 3, He expressed his deep love and concern for them as they are suffering for their faith. So Paul encouraged them to stay faithful and to stay focused. He also encouraged them to stand fast in the Lord. And then, as we saw last time, Paul prayed for them. Look what Paul says next, chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. What? Your sanctification. And we'll stop there. Here in today's passage, Paul begins his final section of this letter. And he starts by showing the Thessalonian believers how God wants them to live out their faith. Look, verse 1 starts out with the word therefore. And while there is still two more chapters left in this letter. And while this isn't the final conclusion of the letter, the word therefore transition us to the final section of this letter, generally speaking. Here Paul gets very practical for us as Christians and he shows these believers and us today what God wants from us as lovers of Christ. So Paul begins by saying, finally then, brethren, Christians, fellow believers, brothers and sisters in Christ... We urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus. And this shows us the seriousness of what Paul's going to say next. See, the word urge means to plead, to implore, and it even means to beg. The word's interesting because instead of coming across as a demand or as a command, this word instead speaks of a friend making an urgent appeal to another friend. The word exhort literally means to call alongside And the picture is of a loving and caring soul coming up to a needy soul, putting his arm around that needy soul, and then speaking words of comfort, love, instruction, and encouragement into the ear of that needy soul. So these two words used together show us the deep love and the intense care that Paul has for these believers in Thessalonica. And it also shows us the vital importance of what Paul's going to say next. I mean, you can almost hear the the passion and the love and the concern in Paul's own voice as you read these words. What does he say? First this, abound more and more. Abound more and more. And the context of this abounding more and more is walking so as to please God, which we're going to get to in a second. But before we look at that, I don't want us to look at this word abound and let it challenge us a bit today. This word was used last week when Paul prayed that the Thessalonian Christians would abound in love. But here, Paul is now calling these Christians to abound in every aspect of their Christian lives. The word abound means to exceed, to be in excess, to excel, and to do considerably more than what was expected. Think about that. The picture is of a river that's overflowing out of its banks And that's how we are to be when it comes to our Christian lives. Overflowing, abounding, excelling, more and more and more and more and more. See, more is a good word here. The word means very, very much or to a greater degree. And that's really the call. That's the command. That's the heartfelt appeal from Paul. So good isn't good enough when it comes to our spiritual lives and when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. No, more is better. And here, Paul clearly wants other believers to super abound in the things of God and to super abound in every area of their Christian lives. Not, not, nothing excluded. Every area. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
I mean, God is indeed worthy of this, is he not? Of more from those of us who love him, and there's no greater thing that we can give our hearts and our lives and our souls to, and Paul clearly understood this truth for himself. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says that before Christ saved him, Paul valued a whole bunch of other things that didn't really matter. That's, that's the life without Christ, right? He valued his achievements, how people viewed him, his heritage, his works, himself, and his own inflated ego. Oh, he was very proud of himself, and, and so on and so on. But then Jesus saved him, and everything changed, rightly so. And now look, all those things that he valued so very much before he was saved, he now knows that they all are utterly meaningless compared to Christ. In fact, in Philippians 3.8, Paul says, I count them, all other things, everything else, I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So compared to Christ, uh, gaining him, <clears throat> having him as your own, knowing him more and more and more, loving him, pleasing him, glorifying him, compared to him, everything else is rubbish. Scubalon in the Greek, I love that word. It refers to any kind of refuse that gets thrown away or to any kind of excrement from animals. Did you catch that? So it's either talking about food that isn't fit to be eaten or else it's talking about food that's been eaten and then expelled. You get the point? <laughs> Compared to Christ, everything else is that. Rubbish, dung, garbage. And that's true. That's true. We say, oh, Paul, Paul's kind of being harsh here. I mean, he's kind of being dramatic here. I mean, there's value in other things, right? Wrong. Compared to Christ, that's wrong. Look, apart from Christ, you end up in hell. And gaining the world and yet forfeiting your soul to eternity in hell is the, the height of folly. Nothing matters but Christ and everything else apart from him is dung. It doesn't last. It, it, it's fading and fleeting. It's meaningless in the end. Think about it. I mean, you eat, drink, and be merry, and then you die and go to hell? No. That's, that's devastating. See, where you spend eternity should be your chief concern and if you have been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, and if you're going to spend eternity in heaven instead of hell, come on, nothing compares to that. Anybody? <laughs> Paul clearly understood that, so he says in Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Just to give us an example of this abounding more and more, look what he says. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, more. More. Now, now that Christ has saved me and rescued me and given me a reason to live, more, because he certainly is worthy of more. See, Paul, Paul's only aim now is to please Christ, and he knows the, uh, the, the holy and sanctified life glorifies and pleases Christ. Therefore, that's what his aim was this side of glory. No, he hasn't yet achieved this great aim of being perfectly Christ-like and of being perfectly God-pleasing. Verse 12, that said, he never will either. That said, it's still his aim. And because he loves Christ so very much, he's never going to quit pursuing this great God-pleasing aim. Paul said, God saved me from wrath. He rescued my soul from eternity in hell, which I rightly deserved he delivered my soul from eternal misery. And the least that I can do in light of that is to make it my aim to live completely for him and for what pleases him. And I'm not going to be satisfied with anything less. So what do I do? I press on. More. <laughs> More. The word for press on means to follow or press hard after. and means to pursue with earnestness and with diligence and to move quickly and energetically towards some objective. The word pictures strenuous activity. Uh, this is no let go and let God mentality here. No, this is strenuous work for the glory of God compelled by passionate love for the God of glory. So it's a call for more. It's a call to passion in the faith and in the things of God. It's a call to diligence 
in the Lord, to hard work at holiness and to battling against sin and to daily fighting strenuously against the enemy of our souls. It's a call to never quit, to never be satisfied, to never stop this side of glory. Why? Because you love God and he's worth it. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Paul says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. In other words, a run to win. <laughs> run the race with maximum effort. Don't, don't make excuses. Don't, don't settle for mediocrity. Don't throw up your arms and say, oh, just, that's just how I am. Don't, don't do that. No. Keep battling all sin. Don't run half-heartedly. No. Run all out because Jesus deserves more from us today, abounding more and more. So as Paul says in Philippians, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So you got to forget those things which are behind. Forget what? Well, forget anything that will hinder you from moving forward. Either your bad past that can cripple you, you know, stop dwelling on that. Give it to the Lord, let it go, and move on. Or else the good things that you've done in the past that can go to your head and make you settle in with where you're at. No, no, no. Forget all that and press forward in the Lord. The point here is never to look back, but the point is only look back for the sake of pressing forward. John Piper says that memories of success can make you smug and self-satisfied. Memories of failure can make you hopeless and paralyzed in your pursuit of God. Never look back like that, but rather give humble thanks for successes, make humble confessions of failures, and then turn to the future and go hard after God. And that's absolutely right. So Paul says that he reaches forward, he presses on, or as he says in 1 Thessalonians, he abounds more and more. And look, he's not settling for good or he, even for really good. No, he never settles for anything except for more. Paul C. was a man of single purpose. Paul had one aim and one ambition, Christ, and perfectly pleasing Christ in this fast and fading life. Why? Because all else is rubbish, right? Everything else is a, is a waste. There's a much needed reminder for us here today in this culture where spiritual mediocrity and compromise abounds. So here's a question. What are you abounding in today? What are you abounding in today? Hey, if, there, if there's one thing to be abounding in life about, if there's one thing to be passionate about, to be zealous for, to be pressing towards, to be excited about, to be toiling in, and to be earnestly pursuing, it's the Lord and in glorifying Him. So, so let's abound in that. Let's get on with it more and more and more. Sadly, our trouble today isn't abounding like this. Our trouble today isn't too much passion for Christ. That's not our problem. It's too little. Brother Andrew said it's easier to cool down a fanatic than to warm up a corpse. Too many are like corpses in the church these days. Richard Cumberland said that it's better to wear out than to rust out. Too many are rusting out for Christ these days. J.C. Ryle says that a zealous man in, in religion is a man of one thing. He sees only one thing. He cares for one thing. He's swallowed up in one thing. And that one thing is to please God. And that's absolutely right. That's the same thing that Paul says in Philippians. And it's the same thing that Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians. So, where, oh where, are the Christians who want more? Who want to abound? Who want to press on with fervor and with passion, compelled by love for their amazing God who saved them? Are they here? In case I caught you off guard, are they here? Yes, yes okay, I believe that. I believe that. But we need reminders. Sadly, less seems to be the motto for many. I say not here. Not here. And it begins with me. These are serious times. It's not enough to just exist as a Christian. No, we got to move forward. we got to move towards excellence more and more and more 
for, for, for Christ. God wants us to move beyond the status quo. <laughs> because no matter how far a Christian has come in love and in holiness, hey, there's still room to abound more and more. And love should propel us forward, should it not? It should propel us forward. So let's, let's keep abounding. Second, Paul exhorts us to walk well. Verse 1. You should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk. So how ought you to walk? Well, you ought to walk well. You ought to walk worthy. You ought to walk in a God-pleasing way, which we're going to look at in a second. But clearly, the exhortation is for these Christians to be abounding in a God-glorifying walk. Note that the word walk speaks of your lifestyle and of your conduct. Life is often represented as a journey, and the Christian call is to walk well, to walk worthy on this journey. Paul mentions the Christian walk in other places, and he also mentions it in this letter in 2.12, where he implored the Christians in Thessalonica to walk worthy of the God who calls you. And clearly, Paul's imploring them here to abound in a worthy, well, (laughs) solid Christian walk. That word for worthy back in chapter 2, which I believe is implied here in chapter 4, is from the Greek word axios. It refers to having the same weight as something else, like a set of scales that, that balance with the same weight on one side as with the same weight on the other side. The word indicates equivalence. For example, a person is worthy of his pay when a person whose day's work corresponded to his day's wages. So a person's walk is one side of the scale and is calling as a Christian is the other side of the scale. The idea then is this, that our manner of life weighs as much as the gospel that we proclaim to believe in. That there is a corresponding balance between our profession and our practice. Right? Our profession is that we are Christians who who love the Lord with passion and with fervor. Our practice then is that we live like Christians. That we live like Christ himself more and more and more. And so our conduct should balance the scales with the other side of the scale being Christ himself. How are you doing? (laughs) What a challenge. But it's a challenge that we need to meet and be pursuing until glory. In Philippians 1.27, Paul tells those believers to let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. It's the same idea. The word conduct in Philippians is interesting because it's a word that's used for citizenship. So Paul ties in a worthy walk with understanding where your true home is at. That's good to remember, isn't it? Where's your true home? Here? I hope not. Right? I hope not. The call, our our home as Christians is, is heaven. That's home. And our call is to live in light of that reality. For someone who does that will then be walking well, walking worthy, walking like a citizen of heaven. It's vitally important for us to remember this today, that we as Christians are registered citizens of heaven. Our Savior is there. Our true home is there. Our fellow saints are there. We're all going to end up there. And our inheritance is there. So live in light of that reality because all this other stuff doesn't matter. All this other stuff fades away and rots. Again, live worthy of the gospel of Christ. Balance the scales. Have your daily conduct as Christians reveal that we really are pilgrims and strangers on planet earth and and walk well for the glory of God. The third exhortation that Paul gives the Thessalonian believers is to please God, the end of verse 1, and this ties in with what we just looked at. Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So The worthy walk, then, is a God-pleasing walk. And we knew that, right? Note that this is something that Paul has told them before. This is something that they already knew. This is uh, instruction that they had already heard, verse 2. But even so, they needed to be reminded of it again and again and again and again. And so do we, because it's easy to forget. See, you are here for the good pleasure of God. So walk well. See? To please means to give or to be the source of satisfaction, pleasure, or contentment to another. All right, who? To God. Again, that makes sense. I mean, we love Him, so we want to please Him, right? That makes sense. One noted whether in the ancient world or today, the chief end of humanity has often been to take pleasure in this life. In contrast, 
Our passage begins by affirming the opposite. Humanity's chief goal ought to be to take pleasure in pleasing God. And that's absolutely correct. Because to have him is to have everything, and he makes everything else meaningful. He makes everything else truly worthwhile. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 5.1. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. See, that's the aim, right? That's the goal. That's our ambition. That's our focus, being well-pleasing to him. The word for aim comes from two Greek words that mean to love, honor. It's very interesting. What does that mean? It means that the most honorable thing, the most noble thing, the, the thing that we in Christ ought to strive after and the thing that we ought to be relentlessly pursuing is pleasing the Lord. Notice that in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says it's our aim. And then he says, whether present or absent. Isn't that interesting? What does it mean by that? Present or absent? In the previous verse, he mentioned being absent from the body and being present with the Lord. And in chapter 5, Paul's telling us that that's our aim wherever we are at, wherever we find ourselves, whether imperfectly here on earth or perfectly in heaven, that aim will not change. And to Paul, it made no difference to him whether he lived or whether he died, whether he was on earth or whether he was in heaven, whether he was in the body or whether he was out of the body, it didn't matter it was his great fixed principle of his whole life to be well-pleasing to his beloved Lord. See, so this is it, pleasing Christ. That's it. Or you could say a worthy walk. Or you could say, as we're going to see in a second, your sanctification. And the fact that he wasn't in the immediate presence of the Lord in heaven didn't give him an excuse to compromise his one aim of pleasing him. Albert Barnes says, the fact that he's now absent from the Lord, not yet in heaven, will be to him no reason why he should lead a life of sin and self-indulgence any more than he would if he were in heaven. And the fact that he is soon to be with him is not the main reason why he seeks to live so as to please the Lord. It's because this has become the fixed principle of his soul. The very purpose of his life and this principle and this purpose will adhere to him and control him wherever he may be placed or in whatever world he may dwell in. That's, that's right. See, his aim didn't change and his aim wouldn't change and neither should ours. Pleasing God should be the fixed principle of our lives today. That should be the ultimate aim for which we live. It should be our greatest ambition for which we should strive for with all our energy, all our might, all our passion, and all our unction. And the question is, is that your chief aim? Should be. <laughs> it's not about you. It's all about him. And good news, when you're all about, really about pleasing him, that's when you yourself find the greatest joy in return. It's amazing how that works. See, those who are all about pleasing themselves, they're the most miserable people because it's sinful and meaningless in the end, pleasing yourself. But those who are all about pleasing God, they are truly the happiest people because they are doing what they were created to do. And that gives us the greatest joy in return. So it's no burden whatsoever to get lost in pleasing God as our all in all. No, it's all blessing. And if you've made that your aim, you understand that. Look, the first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what's the chief end of man? Answer. Some of you may know this. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. How good is that? For clarity, you could say it like this. Our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy pleasing him forever. And that enjoying him forever, that pleasing him forever, that has to do with sanctification, which is what Paul mentions next in verse 3. So forth, Paul exhorts these Thessalonian believers to be sanctified. Verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Paul will go on and talk about how that practically plays out, which we'll get to next time. But the call here is clear, be sanctified more and more and more. Abound in this thing called sanctification. And look, this is God's will for you. This is what God wants from you as a Christian. Now look, there are two aspects to the will of God. 
First is the determined will of God or the decreed will of God. And those are the things that God sovereignly decrees and ordains, and those things will never change. But then second, we have the desired will of God, which are the things that God discloses to us in his word, the things that delight him, the things that please him. But look, those things can be either accepted or rejected by us. So God says, this is what I want for you. This is what I desire from you, my child. And now we have the responsibility to act on that. For example, God's desired will for Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply, to tend the garden, to subdue the earth, and to not eat from a certain tree. What did they do? They rebelled against God's desired and revealed will. Here's a word of advice. Don't do that. Here in verse 3, we see what God's desired will is for all his beloved children. What's that? It's our sanctification. And the fact that this is what God wants from us should be of vital and profound interest to us, and it should provide the direction and the inspiration for our entire lives. I mean, God tells us very clearly what he wants from us, and now we all have a responsibility to act on that. And how could we not if we love him? Pursuing sanctification. What then is sanctification? The word means holy or set apart. The idea of sanctification is a separation from that which is secular and sinful and the setting apart for a sacred purpose and for God's special use. So the word means holiness, godliness, Christ-likeness, purity, a set-apartedness from everything that's sinful, dirty, marred, and stained by sin. This word is related to the word saint, and both words have to do with holiness. Now look, in the New Testament, there are three kinds of sanctification. First is positional sanctification. This ties in with our justification, which is the one-time event that occurs at true salvation, where we who believe are declared right and righteous by God, by grace through faith in Christ, because of what he did on the cross for everyone who believes. Positional sanctification, then, is the once and for all setting apart of sinners unto God as saints. And this aspect of sanctification is possessed by every true believer, the moment of true salvation and conversion. See, every true believer has been sanctified. We have been once and forever separated unto God, to himself, for all eternity. Amen. Praise the Lord. We should be excited about that. (laughs) A second kind of sanctification is progressive sanctification, which is the lifelong process of growing in our holiness for the glory of God. So while we are positionally holy and sanctified, done, that's taken place. If you're a Christian, that's happened already. Look, practically speaking, we all have a long way to go, right? (laughs) Progressive sanctification is, is our lifelong pursuit of practical holiness, spiritual growth, and maturity and fruitfulness in the Lord. This aspect of sanctification is to be earnestly pursued by the believer, and the aim is to continually be being sanctified more and more and more by becoming more and more like Christ. Now, how is that possible? Hard work for the glory of God using God's means of growing in holiness and of fighting sin. Like what? Well, the primary means of sanctification is, anybody know? Anybody guess? I mean, the Word of God, right? We know that. Of course, along with prayer and godly fellowship that encourages us in the faith, the call is to be daily growing in the Lord, becoming more and more like Him, using His means with passion and fervor that he's given to us, fighting sin and pursuing the godly life, which is indeed possible for God's children with whom he indwells. The third kind of sanctification is complete sanctification or ultimate sanctification, which is also called glorification. This will happen when we finally die and go to glory. Can't wait for that. And there we will experience the ultimate separation from sin and a total 
sanctification in every regard. We will be made perfect in heaven. Anybody excited for that? No more sin. Perfection, eternal glory. That's coming, but until then, we keep pursuing what God desires for us. And here in verse 3, Paul is clearly talking about our progressive sanctification. What does this tell us? That God wants you to be growing in your faith. Right? Abounding more and more and more so that you're daily becoming more and more like Christ, less sin and more of Christ. One noted, because of their living union with Christ, believers are the holy ones, the saints, and therefore they can and should seek daily to grow in personal holiness, in character and in conduct. That's right. Not to get to heaven, we're already going to heaven, but because we love him and we want to please him and this is what pleases him. Sanctification includes two things. First, it means that you cease to do evil. More and more and more. <laughs> In other words, the vices which debase and degrade the soul are daily fought against and continually rejected. And then second, sanctification means that you pursue and cultivate the principles of holiness and Christ-likeness within your soul. That is what God wants from us, and that is what we must be continually pursuing with fervor, passion, unction, and zeal. The good news is that we can indeed grow in our sanctification, and we must grow in our sanctification. In Ephesians 4.22, Paul tells us that we are to put off concerning our former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And that's something that we are commanded to be daily doing. Put off, put off, put off, put off. Continual. Now look, when we first trusted in Christ in true saving faith, that old life was killed. Praise the Lord. Dead. Gone. We put on the new life. The call now is to live daily in light of the truth of what God says we now are. We are new creatures in Christ, and we are called to live each day in light of that truth by decisively putting off the old life, being renewed in our minds, and putting on the new life. So, to grow in sanctification, Paul says that we need to put off the old man. What's the old man? The old man is speaking of our former manner of life before we were saved. Talking about everything that we were before we were rescued by grace through faith in Christ, when we were ruled by evil desire and practices. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 6, and there he refers to the putting off of the old man as an already accomplished fact. He says that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So clearly, the old self was crucified with Christ the minute we got saved, that died. And as a Christian, you are not the same person you were before you got saved. Anybody? That should be the reality. Because the old died. In Christ, you have a new life, you have a new heart, a new spiritual strength, a new hope. And good news, our old life, the old man, that's been put to death and destroyed. That's real good news because that means that as a Christian... Sin's power over you and its penalty has been put to death. Satan cannot have you anymore. Sin can't condemn you anymore. And good news, you have God's spirit now indwelling you who gives you true power for victory in this fading life. So the old man has already been put to death. But look, we're also called, interesting, to put the old man to death day by day by day. Interesting. In other words... We must daily apply experientially, experientially the facts that are true of us positionally, which is sanctification. Martin Lloyd-Jones gives this illustration. He says, When Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, they were officially free from their many years of servitude, but some of them went on living as if they were still slaves. The president's proclamation gave them legal standing as free citizens. It was a done deal. They were no longer slaves. But out of habit and of way of thinking... Many of these poor people still live like slaves. So they needed to live in accordance with the new facts. When they were tempted to think like a slave, they needed to say, no, the truth is I am now a free man. So they needed to appropriate that truth into their daily experience. And the same is true for those of us in Christ today. See, 
When Christ saved us, he liberated us from spiritual death and bondage to sin. He gave us new life. We are now saved. We're going to heaven. Sin can no longer condemn us in Christ because he won the victory for us on the cross. And when he won, we won too because we are in him. That said, we also must daily put off the dirty clothes of sin and put on the new clothes of righteousness and holiness in him. See, there's still in us a strong tug of the old life. But the good news is that we don't have to yield to that, but instead we can have growing victory over that day by day by day. That said, this doesn't mean that we will no longer sin, even though the old man has been destroyed. You can say if you're the old person. Why? Because we live in a sinful world and we have this flesh to contend with still, right? These eyes, our pride, and the memories of the old life that we have died to. So it's still a fierce battle, not a losing one, no, but a fierce one nonetheless. Anybody know that? Picture two adjoining fields. One field is owned by Satan. The other field is owned by God. And they're separated by a road. Good field, bad field. Okay. Road. <laughs> Before salvation, a person lived in Satan's field, totally subject to his jurisdiction. After salvation, a person works in the other field, now subject only to God's jurisdiction. As he plows in the new field, however, the believer is often cajoled by his former master who seeks to entice him back into his old sinful ways. And sadly, Satan often succeeds in temporarily drawing the believer's attention away from his new master and his new way of life. However, he is powerless to draw the believer back into the old field of sin and death. In other words, yes, we have indeed died to the former way of life that, that was controlled by sin and death. We, as Christians, are in God's field done. However, we still battle sin and we still battle the old ways. Here's another way to put it. That as Christians, we are no longer in the flesh before we were saved, we were in the flesh. But now that we are Christians, we are no longer in the flesh, which characterizes non-Christians. Instead, we in Christ have a new life. We have God the Spirit living inside of us. We are in Christ. And our fallen sinful nature has now been replaced with a new spiritual nature, with new hearts that have been washed clean. Done, done, done. However, while we are no longer in the flesh, we still have to battle against the flesh. We are saved, but we still have to battle. John MacArthur says we must battle because while we have a new nature and a new heart, it's incarcerated in our unredeemed human flesh. So he says that's why we have a spiritual battle because the new man is battling our flesh. One likened it to Lazarus who had been raised up from the dead. Lazarus is dead for four days, right? Four days. Jesus came and gave life to him. When he came out of the tomb, he still had the old grave clothes on. As Christians, we too have been given new life in Christ, but we still have our old grave clothes on that we have to continually be shedding. And the battle with the flesh, the battle for a more sanctified life, is like the shedding, daily shedding, of those old grave clothes. So even as Christians who have been saved and justified and cleansed and been given a new nature with God Himself, God the Spirit living inside of us, we still have to battle the flesh in this life, the old man, and our call is to keep battling. The call is to keep day by day putting off the old man and putting on the new, growing and being progressively sanctified more and more and more until glory. Piper says it like this, the decisive battle has been fought and won by the Spirit. The Spirit has captured the capital and broken the back of the resistance movement. The flesh, the old man, it's as good as dead. It's doom is sure, but there are outlying pockets of resistance. The gorillas of the flesh will not lay down their arms and they must be fought back daily. So again, while there's victory and while the victory is sure, we still must keep continually battling until that time. Anybody here, don't you just wish that when you became a Christian, you would never again have this flesh, the old man to contend with? You just be made perfect, perfectly holy, just like that. Well, too bad. 
too bad. <laughs> Until glory, we battle. But what a joy to battle for the glory of God. What a privilege to battle. In heaven, we won't have to battle. But now we get the privilege of battling for the glory of God. In Ephesians 4, Paul says that you battle well by being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that happens only through the means of the word of God. I can't emphasize that enough. The word of God. You can grow in holiness and godliness. You can. And you should. And you must. God has given you everything that you need to grow. Including his very own spirit who lives in you. He's given you everything. His spirit indwells you. His word that empowers you. Prayer that sustains you. Other Christians who can encourage you. Yeah, he gives us everything that we need to grow. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? You will grow as much as you want to grow. That's up to you as a Christian. God's given you everything you need. Don't blame God for your lack of growth. That's on you <laughs> and me. Utilize the means and dive in. Look what Paul adds in Ephesians 4. He says you must daily put off the old man, and you can, and then put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. What's the new man? The new man is the new self, the Christian self, the saved self, the redeemed self, the forgiven self, the re regenerated self, the self who has the Holy Spirit indwelling him, the self who loves Christ and who wants to honor him with your life. I now belong to God. I, I'm God's beloved child. I've been set free from sin, hell, and death. God is now my father, not Satan anymore. The old is dead, and now I have a new life in Christ. I am now in him, and my call is to now daily appropriate what I already possess. See, we received the old man at birth. We were given the new man in our heavenly birth. And the call is to wear that, to, to daily put, uh, do our part in dressing ourselves with a divine wardrobe, to daily set aside the rotten garments of the old man and to daily put on the new, the things that glorify and honor Christ, to, to reject sin and sensuality and selfish pride and materialism and bitterness and so on, and to read the word of God and develop a biblical mind so that we can then fight sin and pursue Christ and take spiritual ground and grow in the faith and look more and more like our Lord and be the people that God calls us to be as his beloved children. So, you know, he says, be holy for I am holy. We want to be like him. We want to glorify him, right? Put on the new man and live like a believer ought to live. Pursue your sanctification for the glory of of God. Here's a question. What garment do you have on? Have you put the old back on? Some people really enjoy the stinking rags of the old life. They like to take some of those rags and stick them in their pockets and say, you know, I kind of like that old stuff. I'd rather wear this garment than the garment of Christ in my life. I, I kind of enjoy my sin, even though it leaves me empty. I enjoy my bitterness and my anger. I enjoy my lust and I enjoy being covetous. I would rather wear that, you fool. That's foolish. Instead, God's word says, no, put on the new. You have no option. Wear the garment that you got when you received Christ. Pain and trouble lie ahead for you if you keep those old rags on. Why would you go back to what causes you pain and misery? Put on the new man, true righteousness and holiness, progressive growth in Christ. Be pursuing your sanctification for the glory of God with passion. Here's a thought. You're a Christian. Live like it. Every day put off the sin and every day put on Christ and who you now are as his child and then live like it more and more and more. Living like the unsaved isn't who you are anymore if you're a Christian. But living like a Christian in true righteousness and holiness, abounding, walking well, walking worthy, pleasing God, and being more and more sanctified, that has lasting and eternal value. It brings true satisfaction to the eternal soul, and it pleases the God who made you, which in turn gives you the greatest joy and pleasure back. So, live up to who you are. God wants you to be fighting sin and pursuing holiness, purity, godliness, and his glory in your life, and more is better. More is better. Listen to this. J.C. Ryle wrote this. Look forward. Look onward and forward to the end. Your best things are yet to come. Time is short. The end is drawing near. The latter days of this world are upon us. Fight the good fight. 
labor on, work on, strive on, pray on, read on. Labor hard for your own soul's prosperity. Labor hard for the prosperity of the souls of others. Strive to bring a few more with you to heaven and by all means to save some. Do something by God's help to make heaven more full and hell more empty. Lord, help us to abound more and more in these things, compelled by passionate love for our incredible God who saved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to be an abounding people. Help us, Lord, to be well-pleasing in your sight. Help us, Lord, to be a sanctified people more and more and more. May we not be uh, satisfied with the status quo. May we not be satisfied with where we're at, even though where we're at might be a good. <laughs> Help us to abound for your glory because we love you and because you are worthy. Use us, we pray. May we encourage one another with your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen.